I believe it was uh, the 28th president of the United States of America uh, that proclaimed Mother's Day over 100 years ago as a national celebration. Even before him, most presidents, most great people have always acknowledged the role of their mother. It was quoted that even Abraham Lincoln said, I remember my mother's prayer, and they have always followed me. They have clung to me all my life. What we're observing today is observed by at least 40 countries over the world. Billions of people set aside at least one day to honor and take the opportunity, rather, to honor mothers. Thank them for their effort in giving them life, in raising them, and being their constant support and well-wisher. Most of us, if not all of us, can at least count on the support of our mothers, no matter what is going on in our lives. So it's only appropriate to set aside a day to honor mothers. And as I was thinking about that, I thought about uh, Ada in the book of Genesis. One of the things he said when he saw his wife, the Bible says he named his wife Eve because she will become the mother of all the living. That tells me that before Eve never had a child, she was called a woman. She was called a mother. So today we expand that by honoring all the women in the house. Even if you're a young woman aspiring to be a mother, this still applies to you. We want to honor you today and thank you and let you know that we appreciate who you are as a person. Amen. I also want to talk about Jesus Christ's attitude towards mothers. One of the very last words of Jesus before he passed away was to look after his mother. In John chapter 19, verse 26 and 27, when Jesus saw his mother there and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said to her, Woman, here is your son. And to the disciple, here is your mother. From that time on, the disciple took her into his home. So one of the last acts of Jesus is to make sure his mother was taken care of before he passed away. Because mothers, they occupy a very special place in our lives, in our heart, in the society. The word mother doesn't just represent the source of life. That's what it represents. It's also important to know that that word is very similar, similar almost in every language. English mother, many languages, mama, mama. Is so even in languages that doesn't have, uh, that don't have historical connection. It's amazing. It's regarded to be probably the oldest word, single word, in the history of human being. The word mother. When we hear mother, we hear source of life. When we hear the word mother, we hear a nurturer. And I can say the mothers here have, have nurtured. They have given life. They have supported. And we thank you and honor you today in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. As I was preparing for this service in the last few weeks, I really don't want to come here and just give a sermon. Uh, everybody knows I can do that. That's why you come here every Sunday. But I really set aside, I'm aside time to really ask God, and I said, Lord, what is in your heart for the women that are going to come here today? What is the word in your, what do you want me to tell them? It doesn't matter how many sermons, how many messages we give. What is most important is what do you want me to say to them as a message? I took our time, fasted, prayed, and he gave me three words, three sentences, or three messages that he wants me to tell the woman in here today. And it's very important. I want you to take note of that. The first word or the first phrase he gave me, he said, tell the woman here that I feel their pain. This is a word from the Lord for you. So if you're a woman here, I want you to know that the Lord asked me to tell you that he feels your pain. And he, he followed with another sentence. I want you to tell them 
that I am their help and their vindication. I am their help and their vindication. And I believe that is speaking to a number of people here today. The third thing he wants me to tell you is that many of you take your pain to the wrong place instead of coming to him. And he reminded me, let my Matthew 11, verse 28, 29, Come to me, all you who are weary, are burdened, and I will give you rest. So take my yoke upon you and learn from me. I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest to your soul. So what I'm going to do today is pray for the woman here. But before I pray, I will share a few things. Uh, just to expand those three sentences I gave, or three words I gave, to expand on that, because I really feel in my heart that he wants me to pray for the woman today. A lot of you are going through pains, and he's the healer of all pains. And there are three categories of pain that he wants us to pray for today. A number of you here today are going through physical pain. And this is physical pain that comes simply as a result of being a woman. All right? There's a woman in the scripture, in the book of Mark, chapter 5, a few verses there, I believe from 25 to about 10 verses from there. The story is recorded. We call her the woman with the issue of blood. The Bible said this woman was suffering. So it was hemorrhaging. Suffered a great deal from bleeding and he suffered this for 12 years many years i mean that's a very very tough thing to go through only women understand what that means most of us don't really understand that so she was going through this and the bible says in verse 26 she she has suffered a great deal under the care of many doctors and had spent all she had so she was having this physical pain related to women, and she's gone to several doctors, instead of being taken care of, instead of feeling better, you know, she even suffered in their, you know, uh, under them, under their care. And not only did she suffer, she spent a lot of money. Yet, instead of getting better, she grew worse. Can you please display those scriptures as I'm talking about them, all right? Open the scripture so we, we, everybody can follow. All right. So this woman, when she heard about Jesus, said then she went to the right place. Now, for years, she was going to a lot of places, which we all do. That's fine. She was going to. But instead of really feeling better, she was feeling worse at this point. She, she spent out. She spent a, all her time, all her time, energy, but she wasn't getting better. And when she heard about Jesus, she came up behind him in the crowd and touched his cloak. Because she thought, if I touch his cloak, I will be healed. Now, what informed her thoughts? What made him to think like that? First of all, she's heard Jesus has done a lot of wonderful things. That was good. But I think also, it wasn't a problem you can publicly present so it wasn't something that she can just find a way, just get in front of Jesus and say, look, I have this problem. A lot of people did that in the Bible. A lot of people, you know, blind people came to him, lame people came to him. They found their way there and they said, you know, I need help. And Jesus healed them. But in our case, it was very difficult. It was a shameful thing. It was something that even in the culture of those days, she wasn't even supposed to move near someone. You know, she was supposed to be, if they found out, look, you've been bleeding for 12 years, you're not supposed to be here, you're unclean. So she made her mind and said, she made up her mind by faith and said, you know what, I am going to trust God if I go to him. I don't even need to speak to him. If I can touch his garment, I will be healed. Immediately, her bleeding stopped. And Jesus said, I mean, she felt in her body that she was freed from her suffering. I believe before the end of this service, 
a number of people here will be freed from their pain. Because that is the word of the Lord. I believe a number of women here going through physical pain related to women issue will be touched by the power of God, will be touched by the power of the Spirit, and will experience freedom from their pain at the end of this service in the precious name of Jesus. But Jesus did more than that. Jesus affirmed her. I just want women here to know Jesus is at the front when it comes to women issues, women rights. He's the number one. Now, look at what Jesus said. Jesus, first of all, said, who touched me? And the disciples said, no, 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 what are you talking about? Who touched you? A number of people are touching you. I mean, there are thousands of people here who are touching, you know, thronging on you. So what do you, what, what are you talking about? And Jesus said, no, I know a touch. You see, there, are, there is a faith without touch, but also there's a touch with faith. There's a special touch here. There's a touch that came from a desire. There's someone here that came with an intent to get something. But Jesus kept looking around to see who had done it. Then the woman, knowing what had happened to her, because she felt in her body, came and fell at his feet, and trembling with fear, told him the old truth. Verse 34, he said to her, Daughter, your faith has healed you. What an affirming word, right? First of all, Jesus called our daughter. That's affirming. Now, everyone that is thinking, where is this woman coming from? Why is she here? All of a sudden, Jesus stopped all of them. This is my daughter. This is an endearing word. Daughter, I want you to know your touch means something. You see, all those prayers you prayed, all those thoughts you have, I paid attention to that. Your faith has healed you. Go in peace and be freed from your suffering. I believe, God, today that this is a healing service for the woman here. I believe the presence of Jesus is here. As he noticed, paid attention to that woman, affirmed her, he is here affirming you and taking care of your needs in Jesus' name. There's a second woman I want to talk about. I'm going to try to talk about three of these stories today, and we're going to pray. She's called the Samaritan woman. Now, this is found in John chapter 4, from verse 3. The whole chapter is devoted, almost the whole chapter is devoted to this story. Now, Jesus was going back to Galilee. It was one of his ministry trips, and he had to go through Samaria. So he came down to Samaria, and he went to a well. Historically, the well was called Jacob's well. So when she got to this well, she, the disciple had to go get him some meal. So he was standing by the well. As she was standing, a woman walked by. We don't know the name of the woman, but we later know some of his stories. So Jesus decided to engage the woman. Jesus asked her for a drink. Jesus said, will you give me a drink? In verse 7 thereabout. And the woman started talking. You can tell this woman is bottled up already, right? She's gone through a lot. Now, Jesus asked for a drink. He said, why are you asking me for a drink? You're a Jew, I'm a Samaritan. I mean, we, we're not even supposed to be talking. Now, until this time, the Jews and the Samaritans, they, they've had, they had like 500 years of enmity between them. The Jewish didn't really believe the Samaritans were pure Jews, right? Because they have a history of being mixed with a lot of other races. So, so there were a lot of, you're not pure, you're not, you know, you're really fake, you're not, you're not it. So they've had this rivalry. So the Jewish despise the Samaritan. They don't talk to them. Now, so the woman said, whoa, 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 what are you talking about? Asking water for water from me? And Jesus opened the conversation with that. And Jesus started to say, look, if you knew the gift of God, and who is it that asks you for a drink? This is verse 10. You will ask him, and he will, give, he will have given you living water. And the woman 
Very chatty woman. Sir, the woman said, you have nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. Where can you get this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob, who gave us well, the well and drank from it itself? As did also his sons and livestock, continue on and on, Jesus stopped, I said. Look, everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks the water that I give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give them will become in them a spring of water welling up to eternal life. Then the woman got it. Look, this is deeper than I thought. There's something that's going on here. And I love her. She said, look, sir, give me this water so that I won't get thirsty and have to keep coming here to draw water. <laughs> hey, maybe somebody can save me from all this work, all this labor. But the story got deeper in verse 16. Jesus told her, go call your husband and come back. Wow, Jesus changed the subject. And he said, I have no husband. She replied, she replied rather, Jesus said to her, you're right when you say you have no husband. The fact is you, ha you have had five husbands. And the man you now have is not your husband. And she said, what you have just said is quite true. Now, this is the point I'm trying to make. In the culture of those days, you're talking about over 2,000 years ago, women did not have the right to divorce men. Women can't just say, I don't want this anymore. It was a very oppressive culture. So it was men that have the right to say, I don't want you anymore. Then you are gone. So look at that. She's had five husbands because five men have rejected her at some point. After marriage, and they can say, they can do it for any reason. All they had to do was just go and get a certificate of divorce. And just say, I don't want this woman anymore, and I'm gone. So look at that pain. Look at that burden. Look at, the, look at what that means to her. No wonder she's developed a defensive mechanism. No wonder she became very chatty, very defensive. Why are you talking to me? But she's been rejected five times. The, woman, the man she's with now doesn't even want to marry her. And Jesus said, I know all that. And I can cure all that. There's a number of women here who are going through pain of rejection. You've been rejected several times. Not due to anything, just because of the fact that some people can do it. You find yourself feeling really, really, really hopeless. Feeling sorry for yourself. Feeling that you have hope. Feeling that are you worth something. There's a lot of women going through that. What am I worth? Jesus wants me to tell you that he pays attention to you. He's your number one champion. If you can go to him, he will affirm you. I'm going to stop because of uh, time. Eventually, the woman became the evangelist. Jesus gave her the water. Jesus restored her. Jesus made her somebody enviable. In fact, Jesus made her somebody people can listen to again. She eventually took the message to town, told everyone what is going on, and they followed her to come and meet Jesus. And she got her name mentioned in the holy book. This is somebody that was rejected. The Lord want me to speak to a lot of women here. Look, you've been rejected, but you've been taking your anger to a, different, to a wrong place. In fact, where, where you've taken your anger to is going to further hurt you. The solution is not just another man. It's not just another bag, another shoe, another man, another this, another promise here. I want to let you know that Jesus is the only person that can solve your rejection problem. The third category of people I want to talk to today, I will take that from the story in John chapter 8. Hallelujah. John chapter 8. This woman, 
was another person that Jesus, God brought to Jesus somehow to affirm how he truly feels. We like to call her the adulterous woman. And this story is in John chapter 8. So the teachers of the law, starting from verse 3, and the Pharisees brought in a woman that was caught in adultery. Now, I don't know how you catch a woman by herself in adultery. I don't, I don't know how that happened. So they made her stand. Look at that. They are all men. So they made her stand before the group and said to Jesus, Teacher, this woman was caught in the act of adultery. It wasn't like somebody told on her. They didn't get a tip from somebody. She was caught in the very act of adultery by herself. <laughs> and verse 5, they lied. In the law of Moses, in the law rather, Moses commanded us to stone such women. Now, what do you say? Now, first of all, the law of Moses never said that. And I'm going to prove that to you. Let's go to Leviticus 20.10. I think they should have it on the screen. If you can. It says, if there is a man who commits adultery with another man's wife, one who commits adultery with his friend's wife, and the adulterer, the adulterer and the adulteress shall surely be put to death. Right? So both of them were supposed to be brought there. If, if stone is what we're doing now, okay, let's stone everybody. Right? <laughs> but they were, you know, they, they said the law of Moses. Now, I love what Jesus did. He didn't try to debate that because, because he's wisdom himself. He knew, let me not debate this issue. If I try to say, okay, it's not just her, you know, they can say, okay, let's do her first. We we'll go get the man later. They, they can find a way around that. So Jesus decided, you know what? This is about a bigger issue. This is about a bigger issue. So Jesus bent down and started to write on the ground with his finger. When they kept on questioning him, he straightened up and said, let any of you who is without sin be the first to throw a stone at her. All right? So if you, if you want to start stoning, so... The first person that has no sin, throw the stone. Again, he stooped down and wrote on the ground. We don't know what he's writing. He was probably writing their sins. <laughs> so he's writing on the ground. At this, those who heard began to go away one at a time. The older one first until only Jesus was left with the woman still standing there. Verse 10, Jesus straightened up and asked the woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? No, sir. No one, sir, she said. Neither, so Jesus replied, neither do I condemn you. Jesus declared, go now and live your life of sin. I love that. Jesus need, Jesus know that First of all, this woman needs affirmation. All right? He, she was a victim of a rigged system, right? Controlled by some men who just thought we can do whatever we like. And there are a number of women here who are victims of a rigged system. Sometimes a rigged mindset, a rigged culture conspired against you and you feel like a victim. There's nobody, you've done everything you can, there's nobody on your side. I want to assure you today, there's someone on your side. And that is Jesus Christ of Nazareth. He's at the forefront. Before anybody knew about women's rights, before anybody thought about fighting for women, he started doing it. And I'm happy to tell you, he's still doing it today. And he can do it here this morning in the mighty name of Jesus. I want all the women, women here to rise up. And I would like to pray for you. We're closing the service. I'd like to pray for you. If you're a woman here, 
I want you to rise up. I'll wrap up by praying. There's a lot of you going through pain, physical pain, pain of rejection, and pain of condemnation, simply because you are a woman. First of all, I want you to do something. I want you to bow down your heads. All the people are praying to you. I want you to just tell him, Jesus, I need you. Just tell him. Tell him you need him. Look, he's your friend. He's your advocate. He said, he told me to tell you, I will be your help and vindication. Some of you, you just need someone to vindicate you. He's going to stand up and vindicate you. It doesn't matter when, it doesn't matter how, but he can do it. I want you to just ask him. Say, Jesus, just present that. Tell him that. I want you to tell him that specific issue. Maybe you're going through emotional pain, you know, as a result of what has happened in the past. He's saying today, I will be your help and your vindication. This Mother's Day service, I believe, is a healing service for many people here. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Many of you, if you want to put, you want to really accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior, I would like you to do it before the end of this service. Uh, you have uh, the bulletin, and I'll show you how to do that. But many of you need to put your trust in him. You've not trusted him until now. You've not fully, but today, this Mother's Day can be that day when you put your absolute trust in him. Forget about all those things, about other things. Put your absolute trust, and he's going to fight for you. I am going to pray. If you're a woman here, you have physical pain, I want you to just, you know, put your hands on your chest. If you have emotional pain, just put your hands on your chest. I would like to pray for you. Why not? About. Father, in Jesus' name, I invite you now. Spirit of the living God, I invite you into this service. You promised to do this. You promised to heal in this service today. I'm asking you right now to come. Come. All over this building, there are many people stretching their heart to you, touching your garment, stretching their faith, wanting a touch. Lord, I command sicknesses in their body to live right now in the name of Jesus. Every sickness associated with women issues, menstrual pains, uh, fibroids, all those things that are just only unique to men, uh, to women. I ask for a touch right now, a healing touch in the mighty name of Jesus. I ask you to leave their bodies in the name of Jesus. I'm praying right now every pain associated with rejection. I'm praying for emotional pain, I mean emotional healing for everyone here that has suffered rejection, condemnation in every shape or form, I ask for your healing power to flow through this auditorium right now in the mighty name of Jesus. Lord, I thank you because I know you have answered us. I know you have done this to the glory of your name. Thank you because you have answered our prayer. In Jesus' name, we have prayed. Can we put our hands together and give our glory and honor to Jesus? Amen. Thank you. You can have your seat.